the Fosbury flop thesis. On October 20th, 1968, at the Mexico City Olympic Games, Dick Fosbury changed high jumping forever by creating a new technique that is still used to this day. The flop was created because Fosbury struggled to jump using standard techniques. It has been adopted by all amateur and professional athletes due, due to its effectiveness and lack of strength necessary to do it, thus changing the physical makeup of athletes in the high jump event. Over the years, it has grown in popularity and is now the standard technique for all high jump athletes and has allowed athletes to set the world record higher and higher than ever before. Background. High jump contests were popular in Scotland during the 19th century. It was first implemented in the Olympics in 1896 for men and 1928 for women. If competitors are tied on the same height, the winner is the one with fewer failures. If it is still tied, the winner is the person with fewer failures throughout the whole event. Thereafter, there is a jump off where the bar is lowered and raised until one person clears it and one doesn't. Yes, techniques include the scissor, eastern cutoff, western roll, and a primitive version of the straddle. Dick Fosbury struggled to jump using traditional techniques. Up until Fosbury, the high jump had only been done with the straddle and other basic techniques. The straddle technique required athletes to be physically strong. Therefore, only the naturally strong achieved success in the high jump. The flop allowed athletes with less strength to have success in their jumps because all that was required to do it successfully was good technique. Build up. He debuted the flop for the first time during a high school meet in Grants, pa Grants Pass, Oregon in 1963. While at the invitational meet, Fosbury attempted a jump of 5'4", and although he did clear it, his butt grazed the bar. On his next jump of 5'6", he kept repeating, raise your butt, over and over in his head. He instinctively leaned back when jumping to keep his butt from touching the bar, and it worked. He repeated the same on his next jump of 5'8", and it still clear he still cleared it with no problems. Fosbury didn't clear the bar the first two times when the bar was set at 5'10", so it all came down to his last jump. He ran up to the bar and realized his steps were way off, so he aborted his jump. He was allowed to redo his jump, and amazingly, he cleared the bar. A coach then came over to the official and said that one of Fosbury's legs had gone under the bar, therefore the first attempt should count as the jump. The official agreed and told Fosbury that his last jump didn't count. Fosbury was upset but later learned that he still contributed to the first place victory of his team by getting fourth place in the high jump. He earned a scholarship to Oregon State University after placing second in the state. Another factor impacted the popularity of Fosbury's flop. Until the early 1960s, high jumpers had traditionally been forced to land in sand, sawdust, wood chips, or shavings. In 1965, a man named Don Gordon entered the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office in Los Angeles, California, seeking approval for a patent on his cushion apparatus for landing pits for jumpers, vaulters, divers, etc. Approved in 1968, the new padded landing for high jumpers was a factor in making Fosbury's technique catch on because it allowed jumpers to use his technique without risking injury. Part of the story. The physical makeup of high jump athletes has changed due to the invention of the Fosbury flop. The original techniques, such as the straddle and scissor, required that athletes be extremely strong. In the complete book of jumps, this is explained. Most of these young athletes found they didn't have the leg strength they needed, and only the naturally strong achieved much success in the high jump. The Fosbury flop only requires that the jumper has good technique, and therefore they do not need to be very strong. Then Fosbury's technique came along. Youngsters soon learned they could achieve success even though they were not particularly strong. Today's high jumpers need only to be fit and good at the technique of the flop. The physics of the Fosbury flop were not studied, and it wasn't purposely designed by Dick Fosbury when he first tried it as a sophomore in high school. But the flop does involve important physics principles. Strength is no longer as important as it was before, because the swing of one leg and the arms provide that strength, and the arc of the back and twist of and the twist of the body helped clear the bar. In Complete Book of Jumps, a coach's tip explains, the free swinging arms and non-takeoff leg generate much force, which is transferred directly into the takeoff leg. The Fosbury flop was so revolutionary that it is now the standard technique for all high jumpers around the world. His worldwide debut of the flop was at the 1968 Olympics, where Dick Fosbury won the gold. 
1972 Olympics, just four years later, 28 of the 40 high jump competitors were already using the Fosbury flop. Before long, it was the only technique seen at the high jump bar. Using the straddle jump, Valerie Brumel set a high jump record of 7 foot 5 and 3 quarter inches. While Fosbury did not break that record with his Olympic winning jump, the method he brought to the world enabled future jumpers to smash Brumel's record. In 1993, Javier Sotomayor cleared 8 foot and half an inch to set the current world record. The revolutionary Fosbury flop changed the future of high jumping by creating a method that would allow future athletes to jump to new heights. Short-term impact. Fosbury's gold medal in the 1968 Mexico City Olympic Games made others finally take his technique seriously. The last time a technique other than the flop was in the Olympics was in Seoul, 1988. When the world saw Fosbury do his flop in the Olympics, it concerned many people. One quote in the New York Times said, Kids have a tendency to emulate champions, and I hope Dick's wonderful victory doesn't start a trend. If it does, he's liable to wipe out an entire generation of high jumpers. They'll all have broken necks. Fosbury's OSU coach got a letter from a mother saying, You're going to kill my boy. An orthopedic surgery lecturer was said to have watched Fosbury's victory with a touch of admiration and a ton of horror. But when Fosbury was examined by a physician and his style evaluated, it was found that the flop was no more dangerous than pole vaulting. Fosbury never got injured doing it in the months and years after, after the Olympics. No reports of serious injury were made. Fosbury's Olympic win created a fad among youth in America. A headline in the Indiana newspaper said, Fosbury flop better than rock and roll. In track and field news, it was said that nothing electrified the general U.S. sports fan in 1968 more than the Fosbury flop. These newspaper comments illustrate the popularity of Fosbury and his new way of jumping. Historical significance. The importance of Fosbury's flop lies in the fact that it broke psychological barriers and allowed athletes to believe another way of jumping could be successful. It is a lot like when the four minute mile barrier was broken. People said it was physically impossible, but after it was broken, four more people broke it in the following year, showing that the barrier was actually psychological, not physical. The flop changed the type of athlete competing in the high jump. No longer needing the power, quicker jumpers excelled. The flop also takes much less time to learn compared to the straddle as it takes months rather than years. The flop has been the go-to method for high jumpers for the last 55 years. Dick Fosbury's flop changed the high jump forever.